Well, I think that prior to evidence-based medicine, most of medicine was practiced on the basis of individual clinical experience, which is something which is extremely good, of course. But I think with the higher levels of people getting treatment, the need to get concrete objective evidence based upon epidemiology and statistics has become much more acute. And this has led to the huge revolution we've seen over the past 40 years or so, whereby we use strictly objective criteria in order to remove bias from the uh, assessment of efficacy and the claims that therapies can do good or bad. In this way, we have seen many treatments, not necessarily in the field of hemophilia and bleeding disorders, which were traditionally thought to be good, to be uh, fairly ineffective. And this has led to bigger knowledge in the all areas of medicine and improved patient care. So evidence-based medicine is essentially a very good thing. I think in the area of hemophilia and bleeding disorders, we have a situation which is quite different from many mainstream interventions in the sense that in hemophilia, up to the late 60s, we had a disease which was uniformly of a very bad prognosis, but based on a very simple mechanism that the deficiency in the relevant factor led to this horrible morbidity and mortality. Once we had the capacity to develop a concentrate which replaced that factor, the difference in both morbidity and mortality in the children was immense, dramatic and unequivocal. There was no doubt and it was, I think, difficult to think that we needed to put this to the test of clinical trials and the other things we are used to for other therapies. Well, what we have seen in the past, I would say, 20 years or so, as more and more products have entered the market, we have seen an absorption of this landscape, which, as I said, was previously, so to speak, immune from the requirements of proving efficacy into the mainstream ways of doing this, which regulators have used for many years for other medicines. And this has meant that we have seen the requirement for clinical trials um, to an extent which perhaps many of us started to feel uneasy about as what we as people helping and practicing in the field of hemophilia thought were fairly straightforward demonstrations that once you replace the clotting factor you had efficacy. However, this had to be proved time and time again for each product as they came on the market because they were considered and are still considered to be different. And then of course we had more sophisticated modes of treatment as more and more product becomes available including the important intervention which has made such a huge difference which is prophylaxis. Some regulators consider that just to show that prophylaxis is effective that also we need clinical trials. This is causing some of us to think harder about the uh, traditional modes of evidence-based medicine. I think it's because of the limitations which are being recognized that essentially evidence-based med medicine as it is practiced within the paradigm of randomized clinical trials has big limitations when you are looking at small populations of patients which are composed of individuals with very particular characteristics in the way that they respond to treatments. If we look at large populations of individuals, we can see a treatment effect across the population, but analyzing it statistically, we see that there are big differences within subpopulations of individuals. And this is not just in the field of hemophilia, in all aspects of medicine and in all aspects of pharmacotherapeutics when you are, we are using drugs, we see that elements coming from genomics and the population dynamics and so on are affecting individual patients. And now we are seeing that if we actually factor this into the treatment paradigm for hemophilia, we can get better treatment outcomes for individual patients and also make much better use of what are still quite scarce and uh, expensive therapies. I think the key, the, the key initial component of personalized medicine is the characterization of what we call the pharmacokinetic profile of the patient. And that is very simply how each individual patient reacts 
to the administration of a drug. In this instance, the coagulation factor concentrates, eight or nine, or some other ones which are rarer. And the, what we particularly are interested in are concepts of the recovery, the amount which ends up in the circulation, because that's obviously very important for the therapeutic effect, but also of crucial importance and being discussed in many aspects in this Congress is what we call the half-life, how long the product stays in the circulation, which obviously has a big bearing on how long it is effective. So this first characterization of individual patients is important, and we find, and this has been very thoroughly researched by a number of eminent investigators speaking at this Congress, that it's very interesting to see how different patients react differently and how we can tailor the pharmacokinetics to the actual dosage regimen to result in a better outcome for the patients. It is very exciting to see that by utilizing these principles we can actually make life much better for patients in terms of the arduous nature of clinical trials which in normal circumstances can take quite a long period of time and lead to a lot of patient discomfort. If we personalize treatment to the individual patients knowing their pharmacokinetics we can then tailor exactly what we are looking for in that particular patient in relation to efficacy and that means that we can make the clinical trial shorter and easier. And this is of benefit not just to the individual patient who is being studied, but because we can use techniques which combine statistically these effects, we can then move forward to make proposals and approve products for all the patient population. With N of 1 clinical trials, which I personally think offer an exciting option for demonstrating efficacy, the patient acts as their own control, as their own placebo. And I have a strong view about this because now that we are in the era where we know definitely the benefit of many of these agents, I think we are in a dubious situation in relation to randomizing patients between one arm which will give the treatment and one arm which will not in such a way that some patients don't get the treatment and some patients do. With the end of one trial, since the patient acts as their own control, the patient is bound to get the treatment, even though the blinding of the uh, trial design will mean that he or she does not know. And this means that the patient will not necessarily be exposed to a situation that harm can occur because they are not um, benefiting from the uh, good effects of the concentrate being reviewed. This is my personal view, but I would hope that people will start realizing that it constitutes what I call thinking outside the box of the standard randomized design, which perhaps is okay in situations where we don't know the mechanisms of disease and we really have no idea what will happen, and situations with clotting factor concentrates where we really cannot claim that we have the key component of randomized clinical trials, which is what we call equipoise. With equipoise, we're in a situation as uh, people investigating this, that we are uncertain, that we have uh, a view that it could go either way. But we know that with clotting factor substitution, that the view, that this is a correct view, that the treatment is efficacious. We are just trying to optimize it for the individual patient. Hence, we should concentrate on the patient himself or herself. I think that with the use of the N of 1 trial, we can reach answers in relation to new products. And we know that we have many new products, and we hope we will continue to have many more new products. The ability of recombinant technology is not just that we get away from the possibility of infectious disease or that we have unlimited amounts of product, which is possible, but that we can also manipulate the molecule and the molecules can be manipulated in different ways. And we're, you know, all heavily involved in research to make products less immunogenic and lasting longer and so on. By using, I think, the N of 1 trial, we can get answers to many of these questions much quicker than if we had to recruit patients in a mass basis with a traditional power-based design, which will require a long time to recruit and which will then lead to the answers coming much later. And as I said, at the beginning of our discussion, we are very impatient to get these answers. As I shall show in my uh, talk at this uh, Congress uh, in a few minutes from now, uh, both the major regulatory authorities, which means the European Medicines Agency for the European Union and the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, have issued guidances for novel and uh, different types of designs specifically directed to looking at rare disease populations and have expressed their willingness 
to, uh, as I said earlier, think outside the box in relation to these treatments. So we hope and we're very optimistic that the regulators and the industry will be able to design using these uh, novel ways of looking at efficacy, the trials in such a way as to result in these favorable outcomes. We hope this commitment will come about and uh, will result in better treatments for the patients.